um, so terribly sorry for the delay. I'm um, afraid that, you know, some people were late getting here. Now we had a few technical <laughs> issues. So today I'm so excited that we have got the wonderful Kate Faulkner joining us. Um, and firstly, you probably don't know who I am either. So I'm just going to say that I am the lady behind the social media. I work with Maxine uh, very closely and um, I'm delighted at how wonderfully she is doing on these videos. So great to see you guys or for you, hopefully great for you to see me, maybe not. Um, but I won't be here for too long. So I want to introduce Kate. Uh, for those of you who have been to Maxine's uh, Landlord Seminars before, you will have met Kate. Um, and for those that watch the BBC, you've probably seen her on there talking about all things property. So Kate is our guru in the industry. And today she's going to talk about mainly what is uh, the predictions for the property market um, after obviously um, the COVID crisis but I guess we'll touch a little bit on the fact that two days ago we got the sudden announcement that estate agents were now open in the UK so that's all been her scrambling around um, and Max is also going to talk about what Maxine Lester are doing in that regard. I'm sure that most of you know Maxine because you're on her landlord group. If you are her landlords, then you are um, absolutely in the most capable hands possible. Maxine's business is um, award-winning um, every single year, but there's good reason for that. And it's because she does an, an amazing job. And believe me, and I'm sure Kate will agree, I work with lots of agents all over the UK, as and I'm sure that Kate does too. So you really are in safe hands mm. if you are under the umbrella of Maxine Lester Lettings and Property Management. So well Thank done, you. Max. And I'm going to um, sneak out now and uh, have any questions ready so that after Kate and Max have spoken, we can come back with some questions. So if you've got any, get those in and I will collate those on the Facebook and I'll see you later. Thanks, Jane. So thank you so much, Kate, for joining us, first of all. I'm really honoured that you've been able to spend some time because I know that you've been getting involved with this guidance, all 5,000 words and 17 pages of it. So thank you so much for that. Um, Jane said I'll be doing a bit of update, but really today it's all about Kate. Um, we wanted to find out, we want the information with regard to what's going to happen after lockdown and that was Wednesday. So Kate, it's really over to you. Thank you very much. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you are all well. Um, I've now got to find all oh, there we go. There's a presentation. So that's a good start, isn't it? Um, apart from the fact that I've got to the end. So let me uh, let me get you to the beginning. I always find that is a very good place to start. Uh, so um, there is a big question mark because uh, we've no real uh, idea quite uh, how things are going to pan out. Um, but um, uh, I think we can give you some hints, tips and some ideas uh, to help you through uh, what is going to be quite a tricky kind of few months. So I'm going to talk to you obviously about property because otherwise uh, it would be a bit pointless. Um, but the two biggest influences really are how what's going to happen politically and most importantly, of course, uh, how the economics are going to go um, over the next uh, few months and a uh, few years. So uh, I thought, though, first thing I always do is I think, oh, I, when I'm doing a presentation, I think I must just go and check what I said last time in case I said something really stupid that wasn't true. However, handily, and I promise you, and Maxine is my um, uh, proof of this, this is the presentation slide that I did last year. And the biggest piece of advice is that, and I basically said, and don't forget, we're all terrified about the impact of Brexit at the time. Um, and I said to you that the market is uncertain, but it always will be. And over a 15, 20 year period, we're gonna get some upsides and we're gonna get some downsides. Uh, and what I said at the time was critical to your success is investing for that long term, particularly in buy to let and as a landlord. And nothing has changed on that. Build capital growth in at the start. The reason being you're not going to get as much natural growth as you thought. Well, couldn't have been more right on that one. Um, and really get to understand your sold property price data, um, because average uh, prices and i'm going to use some average data today but i'm also going to use some individual pricing to show you that actually they're pretty pointless um, from an investor perspective keeping up with the legal super critical even more um mentioned maxine that i've we, we've done uh, over five thousand words well there were over 21 pages of new government guidance 
when uh, COVID came in for landlords and tenants, 21 pages. If you did not have time to read them, uh, thank goodness you were being looked after by Maxine or you could have made some terrible mistakes. And it's all under about understanding and mitigating risk. So despite the fact we have kind of like a one in 100 year event, um, my views on this really is that nothing has changed and the principles that we set out to you last year and in previous seminars are exactly the same. But we do have a new uncertainty and something that certainly I've never uh, come across before, thank goodness. So the first thing we have a little look at is um, how's COVID-19 going to impact on the economy? Uh, so you might think, well, that's a strange um, uh, thing to put up. Uh, a great big uh, love heart. But I heard this on Newsnight and uh, it was hilarious watching the presenter's uh, reaction because this eminent economist turned around and said, well, what happens to the economy is all about love. And I remember thinking, hang on, what are they talking about? Um, but basically when they say that is that there are, when we go into recession, there are three types of recessions. Literally everything falls off a cliff and you stay down. And that's pretty much, if you like, what's happened to um, Japan. Uh, they've never kind of really recovered from uh, past recessions. The U is where you go down, stay down for a little while, and then things come back up again. That's the most popular, for want of a better word, recession. Definitely for those of you around 2007, uh, the one that we went through. And then there is a V, whereby you literally go, economy goes down, but it goes down for a specific reason. That specific reason is solved and therefore you go straight back up again. So um, this is a, it's not a forecast, and I'll just be very clear about that. This is from uh, the Bank of England, and what they are saying in this chart is they basically charted um, recessions, and you can see those kind of u shapes, some a little bit, bit V, um, and um, they're basically saying that it's not a forecast, but if we have a three-month lockdown, then this is what we think will happen. Um, and that's where you can see at the end, you can very much see this, you, we will go down, but unlike as though we have a big hit in the next uh, six to 12 months, they're expecting everything to come back up again, because once we've solved the problem of COVID, there's no reason as yet as to why the economy can't go back to normal. Now, bear in mind that we should already do better than this because we're only into a two month um, uh, if, I've, if I've measured it correctly, but who knows what day of the week it is at uh, this moment. <laughs> Uh, quite frankly. So what's more useful, actually, um, than seeing that is this chart. And I know there's a ton of numbers on here. Don't worry about that so much. On the left, basically, GDP is um, how well the economy is doing. So the higher that number, the better, the lower that number. Um, bad news. And you've got things like inflation, employment, average earnings, etc. So if you take a look at 2020, we are expected to tank this year. Um, and normally in a year recession, that would be a problem because that's a huge tank, bigger one than we've ever had before. If that stuck around for the kind of five years that we saw from 2007, that would be an issue. But you'll see in 2021, they're expecting once COVID and we have a vaccine, which is likely to come sooner rather than later, that the economy will recover, not just here, but worldwide, and that things will go um, uh, pretty much, as you can see, for 22 onwards back to normal. So there is, whether it's a hope that we have a V recession or whether it is um, reality, if you like, they are two different things. But the more optimistic we are, actually, and economists are and reporters are, the less likely um, it is to have a, uh, from a confidence perspective, a, a long term recession. Um, also, just to point out, a lot of people say because we're borrowing so much, that's going to cause hyperinflation. That is not expected. One of the reasons for that is that um, it's not just our country that's uh, borrowing more money the whole world and the need for money and borrowing uh, levels are going to go up. So um, those that are saying hyperinflation is on its way, it's unlikely um, from this perspective. So the big thing you want to know, and we'd all love to know, um, and I'd be very rich if I really did know, is how this is going to impact, um, this recession is going to impact on property. And the honest answer is we don't know. Um, and the honest, the real honest answer is we don't know yet because we haven't come out of lockdown. It's going to take a couple of months to have a much, much better idea of how, whether those numbers, if you like, the Bank of England and others have come up with it is, are correct. Um, so, but the, this is genuinely the honest answer. And I don't want to fool you into thinking that I've got all the answers and neither has um, anybody else. Even the Bank of England said we can't really forecast what's going to happen because we haven't got the, enough numbers. So uh, I'm certainly not going to usurp um, their geniuses. But there are some things we know. 
And one of the things that I've focused on over the last sort of um, uh, 15 years, really, is how politics um, affects property um, and how the economy affects property. The other thing I've been looking at, which is really interesting, is how does our market today in property um, compare versus 2007? And there's some fascinating figures, um, which may mean we're not in quite such a, a big drop. We had about 20% drop in prices um, uh, last time in the last recession, and that might not happen. I'll explain why. And the other thing I would always say is it doesn't matter what's happening nationally, what's happening regionally. It's all about a property on a street. And if two people are competing for one property prices, where they would have normally gone up, they'll probably stay the same. But if uh, two sellers are competing for one buyer, that's when you get um, price falls. So that basically, that's never changed over the decades uh, that I've been doing this. And the other thing is we're not selling cars. We're not selling uh, clothes. So the difference for the world that we live in in property is the same number of people um, are going to need a roof over their head today as they did eight weeks ago. And in actual fact, over the next year or two years, because your local population is growing, you're actually going to need more homes than the current number that we have currently. So that's where property does should um, definitely do better. Um, than other areas. So I mentioned to you then that the property market today is not the same as 2007. Now, we might learn from this third recession where we've got data to track that it doesn't matter what happens before the recession. If you go into a recession, you still get potentially 15 to 20% house price falls. So that might still happen. However, there's a good possibility that might not, and I'll explain why. So in 2007, for those of you who remember this, um, there were some, I can only describe them as numpties, to be honest, um, lending 120% on properties. Why would anybody do that? Um, but they did. Uh, so you can imagine when prices tanked, that caused a massive issue. Mortgage rates, uh, you remember paying 6 or 7%? Uh, for those of uh, you who are new to the market, you'll laugh your socks off um, that we were paying those kind of uh, levels of interest rates, but that's what they were. And most people are on a kind of two-year fix. We had this huge subprime crisis, and this is where the U um, recession was more likely than a V, because that really tanked the economy and tanked the economy for a long time. And it caused the property market to crash because there was no money to lend. Um, literally, there was just nothing there because they'd over egged it with their daft 120% uh, lending. And if you remember, um, I'm in Nottingham and uh, people are selling one two bed flats for twice the price of a two bed terrace down the road. Well, that was just stupid. Um, and there were a lot of a massive amount of city centre flats uh, overpricing from the Midlands uh, upwards and out to Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and it affected the whole economy. So when you get a normal recession, what happens is everybody suffers. So everybody's income, be your commercial or a business or personal, you, we all had less money in 2007 recession than we did before. So let's compare that today. Now, we haven't got stupid lending rates 120%. In fact, We've got better lending and more restricted lending because anybody who's had a mortgage since 2014 has been assessed at being able to afford six or seven percent while paying two to three percent interest rates. So very, very different. And most people have locked in those massively, well, those really low rates for five years, five years. So nobody's going to get a huge shock in terms of even if rates went up tomorrow by six, seven percent. Um, and I'm not suggesting they will, by the way, um, so don't panic. Um, but most people are on this five year fix. And then we move into the kind of lending liquidity side. Um, we've got the, the mortgage companies have got plenty of money and they kind of have to lend to stay in business. They're just somewhat cautious at the moment. So as we go into this market, we don't think the 90, 95%, we're not sure whether 90, 95% lending will come back at the moment. Top tends to be about 85%. I think HSBC have got some 90%. But we're working with the government to see what we can do to help lenders be a little bit more generous. And bar London, there's been very little overpricing, certainly um, uh, in your neck of the woods and uh, probably Cambridge, maybe a little bit, but not, not in your areas like Huntingdon and um, St Ives. And this only affects part of the economy. And I'm going to be fascinated to see how this impacts on property prices. So imagine um, a road, if you like, um, where only one or two, perhaps 100 properties on there, only one or two come up for sale. But the majority of people who buy are GPs and consultants. Well, 
they probably still want to go want to buy there and they might be quite happy to pay whatever the price was before COVID. Move to another area, for example, um, a docks area, um, so Southampton, I had a little look at, um, where you've got all of the big cruise liners going in, ports aren't working, for example, um, and maybe the prices around there aren't going to do so well. Um, or an area like the Seaside Towns is another good example where they're reliant on catering and, and leisure, which, of course, um, we're only just being allowed out to do. So uh, golfers and tennis uh, players, good news for you. Um, but don't forget your hand sanitizer. Uh, so really, really, we don't know how that's going to affect property prices, whether they'll come down still everywhere like they have in past recessions or whether that will mean some properties on some roads will actually be lucky enough to kind of maintain um, their value. <coughs> and this is critical, I think, um, in that when we went into the 2007 recession, this is, so in 2007, January 2007, UK property prices were running at a 10.5%, which is high. So the normal rate would be about 6 or 7%. East of England doing well. Look at Cambridge, vast 20% year-on-year growth um, before everything crashed. Um, and Huntingdon up at uh, 6%. Now look at where we were. Much, much less growth. And in fact, we on average, we've even seen some falls. So we're not going into this recession for the first time I can remember uh, with hyped property price inflation, which could mean it could pull it down that 20% that we saw in the last recession and the one in the 1990s. So that might restrict um, the falls. Might be completely wrong, but I can only tell you what, what I know from the evidence that I have. Now, this, I'm really sorry that I couldn't get you better data. We have better information on um, England and why I couldn't get it broken down to your area. But the reason this is important is that everybody's worried about house prices crashing. Now, from 2000, and what I know is that from, when you look at England data from 2007 to 2000 and today to 2019, of the people that own a property, which is about 50, 60% now, um, more people own outright than they do with a mortgage. OK, so those numbers that you see in Cambridge, for example, you're only talking about the people affected by house price falls if they have to um, are forced to sell. You're only talking from 2011. And I think this will have actually fallen since then because people are paying off their mortgages. You're talking about 22 percent of the market being affected. People in social are fine and in actual fact, slightly better off. Um, people in private rented, well, they can trade up and down depending on um, their personal circumstances, head back to mums, etc. Um, and for those who own outright, well, as long as they're not, they, if they're forced to sell, they're still not, they're not going to have that because they have a mortgage to um, pay. So we are talking about a tiny, tiny part of the market that might be forced to sell. And as a result of that, that because repossessions are such a huge impact on house price falls, um, we're not, I can't, I just can't see how uh, the pressure that house price falls were under back in the last recession, the previous one, um, are going to suffer as much. So if you take 1990s, I think the number of repossessions in the worst year were about 90,000 homes. 90,000 homes. The number of repossessions in the worst year during the last financial crisis were 45,000 homes. Now, even in a good year, sort of 2000, good years, 2000, 2005, 25,000 homes were repossessed and prices were still going up. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about this in terms of when we come on to politics. But that's important because if repossessions aren't going to make it to the market, it's also not going to put the pressure that we've seen before um, on prices uh, coming down. Something else might hit us, but um, overall, um, we, I just can't see the price pressures coming through that we've seen in the past. And this is where it comes to politically. So have things changed that much? Um, and the question is, are they still anti to let? Um, and I do use that phraseology with the government because I do think they have been unfair on landlords. And the answer is yes. But interestingly, for those of you that are in the commercial market, it's, there's been a lot less pressure for, land, uh, for tenants to pay the rent to landlords than there has in the residential market. The government, particularly in England, has made it very, very clear tenants are to pay their rent. And that's what they should be doing. And to help them pay their rent, there are they have made money available to do that. Scotland, interestingly, usually the harshest on landlords, has gone a step further and said that tenants can get a loan from the government to help them pay their rent 
And now there's huge amounts of pressure for the, um, England, obviously Wales and Northern Ireland to do exactly the same. The next thing is the three month um, evictions. Well, we were already losing protection 21. So I wouldn't be surprised and I would bet uh, um, uh, a little bit of money maybe um, on uh, the three month uh, evictions uh, being here to stay. So bear that in mind. Um, and the other thing to, to, to do again, and this comes back to the fact that you, you haven't got, it's not cars that you sell, it's not, it's not clothes. But say, for example, the demand for the rental sector in the private sector reduces, those, that's probably going to happen because of unemployment. So there's going to be more people on local housing allowance and universal credit, and they still need a roof over their head. And although local housing allowance and universal credit wasn't a great bet last year because it was, it, it was uh, underpaid uh, versus the averages, that has been moved up. They've all been given a thousand pound increase um, this year. And the result of that means that actually the LHA tenant may be more attractive um, than they've been in the past. The second big push by the government as far as property is concerned was wanting to drive up home ownership. Yes, they will still want to do that, but it's not going to be easy in a recession. And these are the actual figures that came from uh, the English Housing Survey. And it shows you that actually recessions are good news typically for private landlords because your market went from 13% to 20%. That wasn't because you're greedy. That wasn't because um, Maxine is evil. It's because of people's behavior. Why would I buy in an uncertain market? Surely I would just carry on renting um, uh, if I wanted or even sell up in the hope of uh, prices falling uh, and rent, which some people will do. And the big thing, and this goes back to that repossession discussion that I had a little earlier, the government are going to absolutely have to focus on keeping people in their homes um, if they have a mortgage and even if they can't pay it. And the reason being is homelessness has gone up by 165 percent since 2010, partly because of mistakes they've made on universal credit and partly because they have forced by to let landlords out of this market because it pays so badly compared to professional um, tenants. And from my view, if I'm sitting there as a government and I don't want that homelessness figure to rise, the cheapest place for me to keep people who are struggling to pay their mortgage is in their homes. We've already seen the three month mortgage break come through. Lenders cannot, just like you can't, lenders cannot evict homeowners uh, for the three months, exactly the same as you. And I think they're probably going to be told to look after people for a lot longer. And of course, that's where my thought process in the number of repossessions is going to be a lot less this time, a lot less than that 45,000 uh, that we had in the last recession. And again, that puts less pressure um, on house prices. But the reality is whatever we talk about nationally, the only rare that matters is the one that you're in. And it's really worth reminding you, if this is just a two year hit, um, what the, basically every quarter, I think it is, the government comes out with and tells you how each region um, is performing. Yours is the east of England. You can see there, southeastern London, the kind of powerhouses, but actually east of England is a big powerhouse um, behind these economies. Um, so the future, the future is still looking very, very bright. If we can just do that, this V recession and get back to, um, I don't think we'll ever get back to normal because uh, I can't even remember what that was now. It feels so long ago. Um, but and the next thing to vote, don't worry that there's lots of numbers on here. Um, I just wanted you to kind of give you this just to show you where the stats have come from. But you have versus all of these other regions, the third highest population. You have the third biggest economy. You've got the third highest salaries and you've got the third highest economic growth. That's not bad for an area outside the London and southeast. You've got one of the lowest unemployment rates. You've got a great mix of jobs. And what I mean in that is that you've got a good mix between the manufacturing sector and the employment in the public sector. And public sector employment is likely to be very strong um, over the next couple of years. So that's a good thing. And of course, you have this amazing powerhouse of Cambridge University, um, which has lots of companies in science. And in the science world, they're worried about the next 50 years. They're not worried about the next couple of years. So their kind of economic dynamics and funding is very, very different to a, a, like a seaside town, um, if, you, if you like. So you're in a good economic area. If you then drill down further, and you'll kind of see where I'm going with this, Huntingdonshire is planning for a huge expansion. And this is all where they're looking to put the houses. And what I love as an investor, new homes building. And the reason I love it 
is because it brings people into the area and guess what they want to get better properties which are closer to the amenities and that's typically the second homes that you will be owning and you will be renting now and you can't they can't build any more of those so it can often when you see lots of new build coming in just as it did in um, Cambridge you know where they, they built all of those new flats I was looking and thinking, wow, those two bed terraces nearby that they can't build any more of are going to be really popular in the next five years. And sure enough, prices of those properties went through the roof. And for those of you who haven't studied this amazing development in Cambridge, Milton Keynes and Oxford, um, it is phenomenal. And this is over the next 20 or 30 years. So remember, you're not into this for the short term, you're into this for the long term. Um, and you're talking about massive new infrastructure who hasn't been on the A14 recently, what a fabulous road, who hasn't queued on the A14 and hated all of those road works, oh yes, but as an investor, I hope you did what I do and say, I don't mind a few queues, because my word is the A14 getting a lot better, and what they're doing is unlocking this huge um, uh, emphasis that they're going to have on being able to build loads more homes. All of those Londoners who hate living where they are now because they're terrified are going to want to be coming out, moving to those more rural areas, but still be able to get back to London. And this is what um, it's allowing uh, you know, to do. So your areas are hugely um, attractive to new populations. And I do think that success is reflected already in rents and prices and uh, will continue to be so. So, uh, Maxine, you know these stats better than I do, but um, they are they are looking pretty good, I think. Um, and I have to say credit to Maxine. I don't know. And I work with huge numbers of agents, much like Jane. I don't know anybody that produces um, better stats uh, than Maxine. So um, you are extraordinarily um, uh, lucky to be able to have access to this information. Most, most agents would be terrified to give you this information. But you can see um, all of the different rents there. Um, and you can see, Maxine, on the right, where it says average percentages, is that um, the increase or is that the average yield? I wasn't quite sure. It's the, it's the, the yeah, the average yield that we're looking at. Wow. Wow. I mean, you know, there they are in London sitting on their tiny 3%. Um, and here you are in this enormous powerhouse running up figures um, of 7, 8 and 9%. I mean, that's just um, terrific uh, in terms of returns way, way above um, what you would see nationally, which I think nationally is about 5%. So good returns on your rents. And this, I'll explain this chart a little bit to you. So you can see all the different towns and you can see Cambridge um, at the end um, of that. So that purple bar, what that tells you is that if I take the average house price today away from the average house price in 2000 and look to see what the average increase has been through all the highs and the lows over the last 20 years, basically you would have achieved if you bought the average property um, about a 6 7% um, increase every single year in your property. And that's fantastic. Now, we know that fell when the grid, which is what you see with the green bar, that was because of a huge increase in one year, um, probably about 30%, I think it was, for every single property in your area in one year between 2000 and 2005. That's what pushes that bar up since 2005. We know house price growth has fallen, but you look at your house price growth in the likes of Cambridge, you're looking at 4.5% there versus areas. So I'm here in Nottingham on my measly 2% um, average increase. Norwich doing a little bit better, Milton Keynes and Oxford um, obviously doing well. And then a slight fall since 2007, because that takes into account a 20% uh, fall in house prices, but actually still not doing too badly year on year. So you can see versus all these other cities, that house price growth is still comparably um, better than other areas. And that's because of the data that I've, I've been presenting to you to date. But it's all about individual prices. So after, over the last few years, we have seen a bit of a, um, a fall in, your, in the east of England, certainly, and in areas like Cambridge. Um, but I thought this was really interesting. I just like the fact it was called Pig Lane, actually. And I just thought I'm going to use that. <laughs> uh, and um, I just thought, there's oh, a police that. station there as well. <laughs> oh, <is it? laughs> well, don't tell me that. I'll completely forget the whole presentation. Sorry, um, sorry. <laughs> That really made me laugh now. I said, that does look like a police house, though, actually, from the olden days. 
So anyway, getting totally distracted, sorry. Um, so between 2018 and 20, most um, regional or um, average data will be showing falls, but you can see that the prior proper this four bed detached, uh, oh, lovely Pig Lane was doing very well. You can see this three bed detached, probably not far away, I don't think, Maxine, but how many miles? No, just around the corner, the spinner's tick. So with this one, it hasn't had much of an increase or any, definitely hasn't kept up with inflation, but it's held its value. And that's pretty important because if you can do that with your properties during this time, you're doing pretty well. Um, now, I love this one um, because what it shows is I imagine somebody bought that for 1.6 and I imagine uh, it needed a lot of work doing to it. So even though prices might uh, fall over the next year or so, do remember that one of the beauties of property, again, you're not cars and clothes, um, you can buy properties for a good price. If they've spent less than a million doing this up and have sold it on at a profit, then they've done extraordinarily well. And that's the trick to always making money from property. Price falls could be your, actually be your best friend if you've got the cash uh, to invest and you know how to add a million to a property, maybe just for spending half a million pounds. So I'd love to know the history behind that uh, uh, property. But this is that's a huge growth if you think about the falls um, that the national figures would have shown you. So individual prices matter. So the big thing I know you want to sort of uh, talk about, and I've tried to leave time for questions, is um, what will happen next. And that's where... It, uh, we really are uh, pie in the sky. Um, but the property market, it's not going to open instantly um, because people have been furloughed. So a lot of agents, I think, are running at about 40 percent of capacity um, at this moment in time. And it'll take them a while to gear up. Um, what I do think is going to happen is there's going to be two markets. Um, so there are currently something like 373,000 homes um, that was, were Offers, offers have been um, accepted before we went into lockdown. The likelihood is from, and this is purely anecdotal, when I speak to couples and what happens is who, who are in this situation, they go, uh, somebody will come on, say Max, for example, and he'll say, well, Kate, he said, um, I, I, should I offer less? Should I offer less than uh, they've accepted? And I'll say, well, you could kind of try it on. And then what I hear in the background, you can do that, but don't you dare lose me my property. And it's quite interesting because you imagine being shut up in a flat for the last eight weeks, knowing that a month ago you were supposed to move into your next forever home with that beautiful garden. You're not going to want to jeopardise that purchase um, for the sake of a few, few tens of thousands of pounds even um, over, the, over the next few weeks. So we could well come back to a reasonably normal market, but some are going to try it on and some are going to probably get their, those prices reduced. So we will see probably August time, uh, July, August time, some impact um, on house prices. But then there's going to be a whole bunch of new buyers and sellers coming in and we don't know how they're going to behave. Will they care about property prices? Once you've been shut in a home for eight weeks, you either love it and you're going to stay where you are or you hate it and you're going to want to move somewhere else. And what I do always say to buyers um, and sellers is it's not about the price because you can't control that. It's about the cost of putting that roof over your head. And at 0.1% base rate, that cost is not going to get any lower. And interestingly, um, Easter weekend, when rates started to come down, or the base rate was reduced, actually mortgage lenders were starting to increase their rates because they weren't making the margins they needed to. So we really, so unless something weird happens over the next few months, um, I do think we are at rock bottom prices. And if they don't buy that house um, at those rock bottom mortgage prices um then they're still going to have to rent or they're still going to have to live with mum and dad and that might cause disaster because they may all be absolutely fed up um, of each other by now so we don't know how much buyers and sellers will want to bargain but also i think sellers will come back in and think Do you know what if i don't get the price i don't want i'm not selling part of the reason for that is is remember over 50 percent of those sellers own their home and own it outright and they don't have to sell if somebody's trying to um, uh, do a uh, do do a deal at ten or twenty percent left. They just don't have to. We didn't have that scenario uh, two thousand seven to two thousand and nine. So for me, I think what will happen is in areas where property is still in short supply, um, there may well be no difference in price at all, and it all comes back to two buyers competing for one property. The price probably won't come up, but it it won't. Uh, it's unlikely to stay the same. 
in areas hard hit by the recession, they may fall about five or ten percent. And Savills have got probably the most useful reports, I would say, um, on this. Uh, and I think they're probably around uh, about right. Rent. We were hoping for quite a good uh, increase in rents this year. I think some are still forecasting that, actually. I think, I'm, obviously, Maxine is 100 times better to know what's going to happen than I will. But I think they will probably stagnate um, this year. Maxine, I don't know if you kind of got it. Yeah, into we've, we've spoken about this before because I was very much, you know, you read the pundits and they're saying, oh, no, rents are going to, you know, you really are, they're going to increase. Given the economics, given the fact that, you know, you don't know where people's jobs are, given the fact that a landlord is really happy to keep a good tenant in the property, there's actually not a particular driver to go, right, okay, let's get that increase. I mean, we've always said, yeah, we can get usually around about 4% increase a year. But I think really it's a case of looking at everything individually and, and then just saying, do you know what? You've got the good tenant there. They've been there through the hard times. They've worked with you. Let's keep it. So that's where I see it going. Yeah, and I, 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 totally, I totally agree with that because you know more about rents than I do anyway. <laughs> so not a surprise, that chart that I put up last year, that chart that I put at the start of this um, is coming back again as my summary. The market is uncertain, but it will be. And even though it's Brexit before, even though it's COVID now, there will be something else uh, come along at some point. These are the critical um, success factors, and I don't think now they will ever change. The only thing I would say, uh, and I'm not doing this, uh, I would always say this about Maxine, you heard Jane earlier, but I think because the next six to 12 months are going to be really quite tough for landlords from a legal perspective, I would not want to be letting myself. I actually always say I wouldn't want to do it because I've got a full time job doing something else, even though I keep up with the best experts. And I'm lucky that my day job does that. Um, I, if I've let before, I've let through an agent. Um, I worked with Maxine for many years and her team as well, because they're a fantastic bunch of people who work with her, uh, who also love working with her. And I think that's always a good sign of an agent. So for me, next two years, don't rent without a really good qualified agent. And I can't um, recommend Maxine enough because she's not just a good agent. She actually really cares. Uh, and I think that's you need that as landlords uh, over the next couple of years. Don't forget that in a couple of years time, hopefully, if we can still get government to put it through, every agent will have to be qualified. So average tenancy is four years. So if you've got any of your properties with an unqualified agent that's not a member of ARLA, not a member of RICS, just ditch them um, and move your properties to a qualified agent. Um, because otherwise they're probably not likely to be here halfway through your tenancy. So I can't stress that enough. Um, uh, Maxine is not giving me a backhander as we speak to say that. <laughs> honest advice, because Maxine and my job is to look after you and make sure you're still here next year to talk to, um, or in six months' time even, goodness knows. <laughs> so there you go. I hope I rattled through that quickly enough. No, that's brilliant, Kate. That's absolutely brilliant. It's a, I suppose as a, a roundup then, as a landlord and someone who, you know, basically I'm always looking for ways to expand my portfolio. Am I hearing then that I'm not going to get that huge drop I was expecting to go and munch up some special deal? Uh, I Let's put it this way. If, let's, let's, let's go from the other side. So... Um, what if you were selling me a property? Mm. Do you wait a year or two to get 10 or 20% more? Depends on my circumstance, as, exactly. as anything. It, it depends on my drive to sell. Exactly. So the only way you'll get a deal is if somebody is forced to sell or just once you might have a landlord, for example, who hasn't been paid for the last 12 months because they didn't use a proper agent. They yeah. didn't get to the courts in time. And there's a lot of these around. Um, and they may not get their property back till, we well, probably won't get their property back till January next year. And those are people that were putting in um, uh, requests in September that were expecting to go to court in April. Um, so if you're one of those landlords, you might be happy to give 10 or 20%. But remember the number of properties that you have um, got to do offers on, you've then got to look for a mortgage donor who's going to be kicked out of that property 
um, or has to sell because of um, debt, for example, for example, for some reason. Sadly, the other reason, so we always talk about 3Ds, which could force people to sell, and it's a horrible thing to say, um, and I, I please please don't be offended, this, this is a reality, but the 3Ds are death, divorce, and debt, and sadly, coronavirus and the impact um, won't be kind on that. Um, so some people will be forced to sell despite the kind of mortgage uh, reason, perhaps debt less so. Um, but I don't know that people will do a deal because what happened in the last recession, the, one of the reasons why rental um, percentages went from 12% up to 20 was because huge numbers of people between 2007 and 2009, and you will know the stats better than I, um, decided to rent the property out rather than be forced to sell. Is that not right? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's where the, what we say, the stagnation in rents, we saw it then, um, particularly yeah. in the outlying villages. So, you know, that's, you sort of say, okay, that could, you know, if anything, that could be the same thing. Yeah. So I, I just, so you might find a bargain or two, but it'll be more than a needle in a haystack. I don't know any phrase for more than a needle in a haystack. <laughs> oh, hello, Wiz. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really... Like, really? stepping down every now and again it's because my dalmatian uh, was by my side and he's now decided to get up have a little bit of a shake and he probably wants a treat in a minute <laughs> excellent you, whiz you get a treat but what was really lovely to hear is you're saying sort of like housing authority tenants are actually quite a safe bet because we do have a lot of landlords that start the conversation don't want any benefits and you sort of like okay why because there's been such bad press and that only the bad press reaches the press. Um, and, and just to sort of like in this situation, I mean, from the point of view, we've got 5% of our portfolio that have got an issue with rental, i.e. 95% of our portfolio that we look after, people are able to pay their rents. The people that haven't really been affected at all as you say, is purely those people who are getting housing benefit because it got bumped up and the local authority bumped it up. And it is that driver to keep people in homes. So, you know, if I could do anything, it's to stop this bad press on people that buy a home or rent a home uh, and pay it through housing benefit. They're, yeah. not, they're not all bad. No, um, I would. I mean, certainly before this happened, I would say that... Um, there was a potential bad deal just because there were so many issues with the universal credit getting stopped and yeah. stopped again and the local housing allowance was um, quite ungenerous um in some I, I imagine cambridge was like the worst where you could get much better money from renting for a professional and why would you not do that because you're getting taxed a lot more than you used to be anyway um but local uh, anybody on benefits has had a thousand pound increase over the next 12 months on the universal credit and the local housing allowances have been um, increased. Um, I'd still like to get a better deal. I'm still fighting for that um, because I don't. I actually think the government, the deal you, as landlords you get is poor. And I think that government should be incentivizing people to make sure that a decent roof is put over local people on benefits rather than them being forced to the road, road landlords in the market. Um, uh, because that seems a ridiculous uh, uh, way of treating people. I almost think benefit tenants are mistreated um, by the government um, and, and not given a fair deal. And as a result, a land, as a landlord, you're not given a fair deal as well. But those, that, those have definitely changed over the last few months. No, absolutely. One burning question that I should have asked you right from the beginning so Sunday we had the announcement by the Prime Minister, and I've got to admit, I was feeling a little bit. Nah. <laughs> Tuesday night, it's all went, oh my God, the market's opening tomorrow. What do we, why, why did it change so quickly? Because we were banking on, it's going to be the end of May, what Mark Hayward at Arla was saying, uh, all of a sudden it was yesterday. So um, there's several things going on there. I, I would like to say that um, as a lot of cross industry work has been going on because we knew that the market was uh, going to be opening up at some stage and we wanted to be prepared. And when in our, in the home moving process, we go for, you've got lenders, you've got brokers, you've got legal companies, agents, you've got um, uh, surveyors, you've got search companies and you've got removal businesses. 
And what we wanted to do, what we thought was, wouldn't it be great if we could have um, guidance that works for all of those people when it came to physical contact, be it your documents, be it ID, be it um, moving your belongings, for example, or doing viewings. So we have been working really hard um, for the last three weeks on developing guidance. We've also worked, for example, with the uh, house kept in touch with the House Builders Federation because they were creating new ways of working for the new built market. Now, um, when you saw Robert Jenrick's uh, uh, presentation on Wednesday, he really talked a lot about the new build uh, sector and they have uh, pushed to open up the market because economically um, it adds huge amounts of money. So for every pound invested in new build, you get about £2.83 back into the local economy. But also, they're one of those few businesses that can build and still maintain social distancing. Yeah. So um, I have to say safety has come first in all this. It hasn't been a fine, and neither from government, I don't think, nor from the industry's perspective, finance didn't come first in this. It was people's safety. Nobody wanted to go back to work. And nobody, because they didn't want to put anybody in jeopardy unless they felt it was safe. So we, uh, House Builders Federation and um, the moving industries worked on guidance. We shared that with government. Uh, and we too were expecting it to be a few weeks time. Um, why did it happen so quickly? Well, one of the reasons was is people, some rogue agents were already opening up. Uh, and other people were still doing moves. Um, and it meant that the market was being left to some extent to rogues rather than the good people like yourself. Um, so I, I don't know whether that was part of it, but I'm glad it's opened up sooner rather than later because of that. Um, so it did happen very quickly. Um, and I think the government has to be quite careful. That, um, uh, I think it is if you're under circumstances making announcements, if it affects shares and things like that. So um, it, we weren't expecting this. We were working on this guidance on Tuesday, chatting it all through. And we had no idea by five o'clock we were going to be told it was open the next day. So um, huge shock. But I'm really proud of the fact that when the government guidance for moving came out in the morning, because we'd worked so closely with them, and I have to say everybody had done a really good job, um, then the guidance that we'd created wasn't that different to the government guidance. So it needed a few tweaks. Um, we'd worked also to make sure the consumer guidance is so for landlords, uh, tenants and for buyers and sellers. We really made sure that um, the consumer guidance was ready as well, um, because people have to understand you can't move in the same way as you did before. So I strongly recommend people read that. I think you've got the information, uh, Maxine, because all 5000 words of it. Yes, absolutely. So <laughs> it's going to be very different to anything uh, you've seen before. Uh, removal yeah. day is going to take longer. It may cost a little bit more. Um, and every, and but we need consumers to play as big a part in keeping property professionals safe as themselves as we're asking property professionals like yourself. So it did all happen very quickly. But I have to say, I think we were pretty prepared for it. Um, it will take, though, please be patient. Um, Maxine, I'm sure you'd be great for me saying that. Um, People are, have been furloughed, for example, and it will take a few weeks to get them back. So please don't ring up and say that you want to kind of move tomorrow um, and expect the agent to come around the next day. That's not going to happen. Um, be patient with the lenders. Be patient with agents, surveyors uh, and legal companies. They're going to be under huge pressure for the next couple of months um, until they've this backlog of work has gone through and they've got their companies back up to speed. Well, I'm going, I'm going to counter you there because... We had a backlog of people that were due to move in from the 23rd of March. And I suppose it was about two weeks ago. Thankfully, we sat down with our team of directors and went, OK, so what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? Blah, 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 blah. Where's our lists? Got all our lists together. Yesterday, everybody hit the phones. So, OK, it's not tomorrow we're moving in, but the first one moves in on Monday. So we've actually been able to pick up the ball really quickly purely because we were prepared for it so oh tick on that to yeah. us well done um hey, if you like, want to unshare your screen then you two can be on together because yes. at the moment it's just going between you two chat right, right i'm just working out how to do that that works okay. yeah, like i think everyone's yes. back now Ooh. there we go oh hello oh, hi daisy <laughs> Someone else wants to be on screen. <laughs> okay. So what what I can't questions. see now, Jane, is if, if anyone's had any questions at all. Yeah, I've got. I've just got a few. Um, 
Firstly, do you think the government's going to be kinder to landlords going forward because they know that housing is needed now, or is it just going to continue along the, another piece of legislation every month that we pretty much get at the moment? Um, well, I, I hope I've kind of partly answered that. So definitely the, my view is that three-month um, eviction notice is going to continue. I think they'll just um, get rid of Section 21 very quickly, um, and then that eviction will continue. And again, that's why I stress it's so important to have a good agent like Maxine by your side, because the legals of asking somebody to leave your home when they're not paying rent are going to be terribly complicated. Uh, and it's going to be chaos over the next six months uh, unless you're abided by the rules. So you need somebody that is good at mediating and solving problems. Um, I guess getting those insurances sorted as well. I mean, yeah. insurances, yeah. rent guarantee insurances. You yeah, yeah, and getting that, getting that sorted. So um, the government's probably done its kindness in the increase in LHA rates and giving people on universal credit a thousand pound bunts. Um, I, the only other thing they might do is they might be forced to follow Scotland and offer um, uh, rent uh, loans to tenants. But interestingly, with Maxine saying 95% of people are paying their rent, I'm finding that um, individual landlords are getting hit far worse um, on rent payments than those that go with a quality agent. Um, so uh, I think that um, the fact you've gone with an agent, you're much more likely to get your money. Um, so that's worth kind of considering. But um, I don't think they're going to be any more generous. And if you haven't been to see a tax consultant yet, go and see them because somebody is going to have to pay for all of this. Uh, and I expect uh, landlords, I'm afraid, will be on the list. So um, if you haven't got a tax consultant who helps you mitigate the tax, um, go and get one now. I think, Maxine, you have some. You've got someone, haven't you, Max? Yeah, yeah Tony's fantastic. Yeah. So, you know. She can help give advice. So you just have a chat and I'll put you in touch. Yeah. And um, just following on from that, um, what about ROPA, the regulations? Do you think that they are going to be put on hold? Or do you think that now, certainly if what you're saying is right, that the government maybe got an inkling that um, rogue agents were doing moves. And I was hearing a lot of that. You know, they, no, but yeah. the rogues were we're not doing anything that the, the, the good agents were doing. Um, surely that's got to be something that they need to, to crack on with and make sure that the agents are qualified. Um, being honest, they're 20 years late in doing it um, to be because they really should have done it a lot earlier. It would have sorted out um, a lot of the problems that they're complaining about and trying to legislate for the moment. Actually, if you've got decent agents, um, hardly anybody gets evicted, for example. Um, so they wouldn't have an eviction problem if everybody was working with a, a regulated agent, um, is my view. Um, so we are going to have to push very hard. Um, I will promise you one thing. I will do my own personal, um, when we're allowed out, um, uh, placard outside of Westminster to say, will you get this regulation in? Because I am sick and tired of rogue agents giving uh, everybody a bad name. But more than that, I'm sick and tired of rogue agents um, being allowed to treat tenants badly and misleading landlords that perhaps don't know better. Um, so we'll be there, won't we, Max? We all go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there in placard. <laughs> I love a good placard, honestly. <laughs> I, will fight, I will fight hard. I think that is more important mm -hmm. than getting rid of Section 21. And I will absolutely bang the drum and am banging the drum very loudly at every opportunity I can get. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. That's fabulous. Um, the other thing was, um, what you were talking about new builds, and obviously there's going to be a lot of building um, happening in the, uh, in the East Anglia area. Are you saying that you would buy, if you were an investor, you would buy a new build, or you'd buy the secondhand properties near the new builds? Is that Ooh. like a, you know... Uh, yeah, it depends on... The, um, it depends on your localised area. So that is the kind of thing I go and have a chat on an individual basis to uh, Maxine about because she knows her area better, her area obviously better than I do. But my example is, so if you take central Cambridge and they built all those amazing new flats, uh, which were sold at quite exorbitant prices next to the station, I just, when I was standing there looking at all of those, I just looked around, looked behind me and saw all these two bed terraces. And I can tell you now that in, um, this is just because I, I study the whole country. So in Hackney, which has had the, in London, which has had the highest house price um, increases annually every single year. Wow. The reason for that 
is because they have so few houses. Their flats have gone up in value, but nothing like the houses. The houses have tripled in value. Um, and the reason for that is they're in such a short supply. Um, so people, um, so I just looked at Cambridge, saw all those people and thought, wow, that's going to bring loads of people into central Cambridge. And the next place that those people are all awake going to go to want to live is those lovely little two bed terraces, which are now, I think, going for similar prices to not that far off to ones that you would have seen in Hackney. So um, it's all about that supply and demand of that individual property on the street. Um, so in some cases, new build can be a better bet um uh, financially so for example in my village actually they're 30 percent cheaper than my 200 year old farmhouse um and that might be better from a tenant perspective and that might be better from a but then i guess you've got all your service charges and things that sometimes when you're buying a new build you don't know until you, um, you know. yes although most of the houses on the new build estates for example so there's a lot of work going on lease mm -hmm. on. you cannot sell a house um, uh, it's very rare you can sell a new build house now with leasehold, which was a bit of a scam in some cases. Yeah. Sometimes it isn't, but in, it was a scam before, but that lenders won't back that. So uh, most of the houses are freehold. And there are some beautiful um, places being built. I know we chatted about this last time, Maxine, because over in is it Alpenbury, um, there, was, yeah. there was one of the most fantastic uh, new build sites that I'd seen. And that had schools and community shops, loads of beautiful open spaces. And you, the properties weren't being built on top of each other. And I thought that was a really, that would be a really interesting place um, to study. It's unusual for developers though, isn't it? Normally they want to oh, oh, just want to shove everything in, little boxes. <laughs> no, they just don't do that as much. There are still cases of it. And mm -hmm. don't forget the density is built is not dictated by the developer. It is dictated by your local authority. Yeah. Don't yeah. blame the developer for something that's not their fault. There we go. I'll tell them off when they do something wrong, as I would agents. But in this case, <laughs> they're blamed for, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm not, scared, not too scared to come after you, Maxine, but I know I'll never have <laughs> Thank God oh, we're okay. That's all the questions. David Monk has now said that you're going to be the government minister in charge of lettings, Maxine. Oh, so okay. that's good. Thank you, David. So we can all be lobbying outside you in the House of <laughs> Well, I'll go with a movie placard. Yeah, Maxine does attend the Lettings Industry Council meeting, uh, which is normally three times a year. I think we have that. Yeah. Uh, MHC, HCLG are present. Um, so um, that is all about looking after landlords and tenants. So Maxine is at least there as a voice uh, on your behalf uh, and invests her time uh, doing that. Uh, uh, so there you go, David. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, any other questions? I can't see any others. Let me just double check. But I think that's all. Um, clock, that's why I know what you love to like down down south. <laughs> She's <laughs> north. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm up. I'm up. Where are you? A one off to the right. Up the A one and on off to the right. Yeah, so near at Grantham Way. That's where. I'm. Oh, okay, cool. And I'm on the M25, so pretty much literally cool okay well that's um all the questions so well i'd like to thank thank you so much kate for giving us your time because you know i know you've been super busy over what's been going on um and yesterday must have been and a very interesting day for you so thank you so much for spending the time thank you so much for giving that fabulous information because i think any information is great when you're Please thinking make sure about everybody that you follow um, Kate's um, Facebook and website. Um, so we'll make sure that that's all in the link underneath, so you can. Yeah, and uh, everybody's welcome to the slides. By the way, they're not uh, they're not they're not secret. Um, so uh, if you want a copy, uh, you're very welcome to those. Fabulous. We'll definitely put some of the stats out as well on the social for everybody else to watch so brilliant thank you Lovely to and see thank you, you jane for the tech so. well you know it's never good but you know i do my best it's just <laughs> it, it works that's the main thing <laughs> yeah we don't have to if i don't have to worry about it then we're all in good hands <laughs> all right well, well, thanks a lot out there, i think so all right see, then oh, thank oh, you oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye